Hi, and thanks for checking out Next Level Carpentry. Making the casing for this pallet wood door for this episode number eight has been a real highlight of the build. I designed and planned this casing uh, probably a year ago, and I wasn't sure until this build video just how it would work, how it would come together, and what it would look like installed. Turns out it was challenging and fun, which always makes for a long video. So I included this list of timestamps to help you navigate all the various steps involved in creating this classy custom coved casing. And keep in mind that all the wood for this trim, the jam, and the door itself is salvaged pellet wood to show what's possible if you put your mind to it. Ready? Let's go. This video is more about the steps to actually make the trim and not so much uh, for making the parts to make the trim. But I'll cover this because I'm working on the glue up process for the blanks for the trim. I've got two of them glued up here. We're going to get to that in a second. But this pile is uh, the strips I made from the wood that you can see in these panning shots of this pallet material. All these strips started out as these three by four blanks and then I flattened, straightened and flipped things around, sliced and diced a number of different ways to come up with the little pieces I need for making this trim. And this is the end result right here for a piece of casing. It's three strips of varying sizes and I've got these marks here uh, orientation marks. I, I picked each piece and flipped them around so that they'll uh, to optimize them for the trim the way it comes out. For instance there's a nail blemish here and that's on a part of the trim that gets cut away so that nail blemish should disappear when the casing is made. But I've made uh, five eight foot pieces and then a couple of four foot pieces for this trim and uh, that gives me one extra just for maybe making a picture frame out of or something. But uh, the size of these pieces come from my scale drawing. Uh, the thing that I like to do when I'm making a custom molding, you've seen it before. This piece of trim here is my proof of concept. It's got the rabbited lip here. It's got the cove and various dimensions. But overall, this is smaller than the final trim is going to be. And you can see that here in this scale drawing. This drawing here is a one to one scale. You can see the cove cut in here. The center piece is going to be maple and these two edge pieces are going to be cherry. You saw that in the blanks I was just showing you. And I made all these pieces over width and over thick. You can see two lines here. The inside line is the finished size. This uh, part out here is my margin of error for the glue up process. So I can glue everything up and then mill it down to the right size to make the molding and that's key having blanks that are a consistent thickness and width. The most important dimension here is this 2 and 3 8 inch. That is the width of the uh, center section and when I actually make the molding it's going to change from uh, maple to cherry right on that little sharp point where the curve meets the flat. That'll be right here right here and I'm explaining all this because if there's a variance in the width of either edge piece or the center piece the transition between maple and cherry at that point is going to vary uh, and that's kind of a deal breaker so I've gone to the lengths I have for preparing these stock pieces to the size you'll see me gluing up so that when I make the finished molding it comes out looking like it needs to. Basically I have uh, three pieces they're all 13 16 of an inch thick this, uh, these are 11 16 wide, the middle is 2 and 3 8 and then I got an inch and an eighth on the inboard side of this trim. This piece gets rabbited out uh, like this. So this material gets cut away and that's where that nail blemish is. I hope that makes sense. Uh, and I'm explaining all this because these principles kind of follow through for any trim. If I wasn't making these two-tone, I would just be making one blank that's uh, this, the size of these after they're glued up. but uh, for picture frames and custom casing like this, it's nice to do an accent strip or a two-tone or maybe an inlay or something to add interest to a special piece. And uh, this is the way I make that happen. It just happens to be on casing for my shop door this time. And I want to show the glue up process this time because uh, things are a little different. Uh, one thing is because I'm using pallet wood, I only have strips this big. If I were uh, buying lumber, I might be able to make these pieces wider and glue up fewer pieces. But the way it is, 
I've got to mill it down to these small shapes because that's uh, the biggest size I can get um, in clean strips out of the pallet wood because there's so many defects to work around. So the glue up process for this is a bit unique. And as always, it takes a lot of clamps and a little bit of um, patience to glue up something like this without a fracas. Notice that I alternate clamps from one side of the piece to the other. That helps everything to glue up flat. And I'm also able to stand the glued assembly on edge while it's drying. And it just makes it easier to handle and maneuver. And because of the number of strips and the size of the strips, I chose to glue these up two at a time. That way I can have the thicker edge out here for clamp pressure. If I was just clamping these individually, the clamps would tend to dimple this thinner molding, but as it is, there's even clamping pressure throughout, and I get a nice straight glue up. Um, all I need to do is remember not to glue the two inside strips, and everything is hunky-dory. Uh, there again, if I was buying lumber and I had bigger strips, I could probably make this inside piece just wider, glue it up like this. There'd be one, uh, uh, one less piece, make the glue up a little more straightforward, and then I could just rip this down the middle and end up with two pieces. So that's a, that's a difference in this case because it's pallet wood. But these guys are all glued up just like they need to be. Remember from the scale drawing, these are over width and over thick so that I can clean them up in um, upcoming steps. A glue up like this keeps me busy as a one arm paper hanger with all the different things going on. I think I've got 11 clamps over there, a bottle of Tight Bond 3 glue. I've got six pieces, 32 lineal feet of glue joints. Uh, all the clamps, etc. I don't have a camera crew, so I can't move the camera around and take close up shots of what I'm doing because I got to keep this moving uh, to make sure the glue doesn't get too thick uh, in between so I can't um, maneuver and align the parts to clamp them. One thing um, Next Level Carpentry viewers will notice that's different about this particular glue up is that I'm doing it flat, not on edge in the vise. If I was just doing one of these, or if the pieces weren't so skinny, I'd do it on edge in the vise. But as it is, I'm gluing them up uh, six pieces at a time. And so I'm gonna do it uh, laid out flat. I make that work out by taking a couple of these little 45 degree angle blocks. These are just cutoffs of scrap from something, but the 45 degree angle on top means there's just one little point bearing on the wood. It doesn't smear the glue around so much. And then uh, I can lay all these pieces out here. Keeps them all up off the table while I'm working. I gotta flip this around so that the narrow strips are in the middle. Like that. And I've gotta pay attention to my alignment marks to keep everything organized while I'm gluing. So I've got that all in place. Grab a paper towel for the messy glue. And I think that's it. I've got a, a, my bucket of guy glitter over here for cleaning up wet glue. It comes up later. And then I've got a sharpened putty knife. So uh, it's showtime. I'm gonna glue, glue, glue here. I turn a piece on edge. I'm just using the dispenser tip on the tight bond glue. It lays out a nice flat bead. And I don't want uh, to use any of those little gimmicky plastic glue edge guides and stuff like that, rollers or whatever. Um, I could just glue it up like that. And then smash that bead of glue down to the other piece. I won't be able to do a close up on this, but uh, I want to make sure I get glue squeeze out all along on both faces of this. I don't want any open uh, glue joints in the finished molding. That spoils the finish. Might be a tedious part of the video to watch, but this is what a glue up looks like. There's other ways of doing this if I only wanted to glue up one at a time and was using small thin strips like this. I could just make a couple sacrificial scrap clamping blocks so I don't dent the finished trim with the clamps. But I like to double up this sort of tedious work if I can and so I'm gonna 
that's pretty good. If I was doing a bunch of this, I would put some protection down on my saw top here because I'm going to get a lot of glue squeeze out dripping on stuff, but just not going to worry about it here and now because I can clean it up. The shop is a little bit cool, which is nice because I don't want this glue skinning over uh, while I'm working. There I put the glue on the wide piece and I'll squish the narrow piece into it. And if, if you work the glue down like this, kind of put even squeeze pressure on there, it'll make the glue spooge out on both sides. And once it's doing that, then I know I've got a nice full joint. There is a remedy for a glue starved joint uh, that I can show you if I get one. But I always like to just kind of err on the side of too much glue because it's inexpensive compared to making repairs. Alright, I've got everything glued that needs to be glued and nothing glued that I don't want glued. So that's a good thing. Slip this together. I'm checking my alignment marks here. Make sure I like all that stuff. Well, there's a funny little bow in this piece here. I'm not getting the glue squeeze that I want. So I'm just going to throw a little more in here. On that joint, pretty much everything I just added will just end up squeezing out, but I'll make sure that it's there's no dry spots in that joint. So that's that. All right, everything's glued. Now it's time for clamps. Change the camera angle there. Um, I'd like to start gluing somewhere near the middle. I'm going to go about a third of the way down this piece and just put a little initial pressure on here to kind of get things working in the right direction. As the glue distributes in the joint, I just kind of push these pieces to get the glued ones, the glued joints to line up. I'm just feeling that with my thumb. And they'll stick there after kind of work them into place. I don't really grab there. Okay. This is why it's important to keep moving. So that glue stiffens up. It's harder and harder to work and get it right. I've got a slight margin of error in here. You remember on the scale drawing, I've got extra thickness. That way, the slight unevenness here, I can um, mill, um, run one side over the joiner to get everything flat, and then flip it over and run it through the thickness planer, and I'll have a nice even glue up. I'm spacing these clamps out so that I'll put um, every other clamp on this face and then every other clamp on the other face. This is lining up nice here. And all these pieces are extra long. I need about seven foot four for the length of the long pieces of casing. These pieces are roughly eight feet. So I got all these ends will just get trimmed up later. That way, whatever snipe I get, stuff like this where that blank isn't milled off quite flush, all that stuff just evens up and goes away. So anytime you can give yourself a margin of error in your blanks, <coughs> it's a good thing because it's a lot more work uh, to dial in an extra level of precision and the way it is uh, pretty much all the extra material that I end up planing off is going to end up as sawdust anyways. So I might as well give myself a margin of error for the glue up. This is all working out quite nicely. And that speaks to um, the work I put into milling these blanks. Um, you remember from the original picture of this stuff, it's pretty wavy and twisted and warped. And every step of the process, I leave myself a margin of error so that I can flatten, smooth, and straighten things so that the 
the blanks are pretty cooperative. If you don't do your homework or try to skip steps early on, this is where you fight it. But as it is, every one of these pieces has the potential of being perfectly flat. They might get a slight bow in them, but they're consistent width and thickness. So when I force them flush in this glue up process, then they stay that way. They actually end up straighter because forces in the adjoining pieces work against each other. And um, the net result is a smoother, more stable piece. So that's all real good there. Give these all an extra twist because I don't have to move things much. There might be some adjustment in between these clamps when I flip it over, but that's easily done by that. I'm going to use some guy glitter here and get this glue drippings on the saw top cleaned up. And with a well waxed top, you can see that stuff comes right off of there even on the metal part of the saw here. If I clean it up right away, it's no big deal. And I hope you can see how these little bevel strips laying on the saw top just help line things up. They don't have bumps on them. It's just one little bearing point. And that uh, really helps line things up. Now I can go through and add these other clamps. There's a couple spots here in between these clamps where the strips aren't lined up, so I'll show you a trick there. And to get things to cooperate, I'll deploy these vice grips. These have a pretty decent reach, and then they have these flexible pads on here. And I can just put those in there. I got a lot of clamping pressure on here. And I can just bear down on that, and it lines those edges up just like they need to be. And <clears throat> these are the same clamps that you get in a Craig jig kit, basically. They're from the auto body world or welding world with those little pivots on there, pivoting pads. But once the surfaces are flush, and I add another clamp, clamping pressure this way keeps them aligned up, and I don't need to leave these pieces on here, or these clamps on here. <clears throat> and that is all well within a sensible margin of error. I'm going to put an incredible amount of shifting force on these clamps at this stage of the game. So that's why I don't get nervous about uh, the time it's taking me to do the glue up because I got options. I can, I can force these things to cooperate if they have any desire to be obstinate. which I really like. <clears throat> and remember, I've got extra width and thickness on these, so the dimples from these clamps aren't going to hurt anything in the finished product. You'll never know where I use them. But if I don't use them, you might notice that because there'd be... Uh, I'd, I'd run out of thickness. Here's a uh, extra long reach pair to get way in the middle of this to get this edge to cooperate. And you can't see that because the camera is far away, but when Vice Grip talks, Wood listens. More clamp down here, and I'll be good to go. That's all nice and close there. Uh, naturally, I use the same process, same sequence for uh, the pieces that were already glued up. Same uh, second verse, same as the first. Now comes the sawdust. And I just lob it in here, throw it on this extra glue squeeze out. And it's a whole lot quicker, as everybody that watches me knows, it's a whole lot quicker to clean this up here and now or the sawdust soaks up the wet glue and the putty knife removes that putty-like um, 
consistency glue. Everything's cleaned up hunky-dory and I'm not smearing a bunch of diluted glue and making it soak into the wood, which is what you get when you use warm water and rags for glue squeeze out. And precisely the reason I don't do it that way. And I'm running this video at over 10 times normal speed to get through this boring little process. But I wanted you to see how this arrangement works pretty effectively for dicey little glue ups like this when there's so many finicky little parts that need to be all lined up with a thorough application of glue, etc., to make sure the finished product comes out like it needs to. Once I get all the glue squeeze out cleaned off the boards, I can stand my whole clamp assembly up on edge for drying, and I give it a timestamp at the end here so I know how long to leave it set so I don't unclamp it prematurely. I'll apologize for getting so far off into the weeds on that glue up process, I wasn't really going to even show that, uh, but I wanted people to see how these blanks materialize that I'll be making the casing out of but um, all five long ones and these short sample pieces are done, everything's glued up, and um, the next step is to get these to uh, uniform thickness and verify the uniform width. So um, joiner, thickness planer, table saw gets that done. Remember I gave myself about an extra sixteenth of an inch of thickness to work with here, so that gives me a margin of about a thirty-second of an inch off of each face of these glued up blanks. So I'll add squiggle marks, highlighting irregularities in the surface. And you can see in places like this that pencil marks highlight places where the various laminations aren't perfectly flush, so that I can keep an eye on them in the planing process. A thirty-second of an inch might be a lot on the end of your nose, but it's not much on a piece of wood. So I've got to make these passes cautiously and lightly. Make sure I don't take off too much from one face of the wood, so I don't have enough to clean up the other face. But as long as I approach it with caution and awareness, it works out fine. The joiner cleans up the first face, making it flat and smooth, and then I follow up with the DW735 thickness planer that does the rest, leaving a finish that will take only a few licks of sandpaper to get ready for the final finish. So all this stuff cleaned up pretty nicely between the joiner and the thickness planer. I've got one spot on the back of one piece right here. See that didn't quite clean up. Another sixty-fourth of an inch will do it, but it's on the back so I'm going to leave it. And um, I didn't want to take the whole stack down an extra sixty-fourth just to clean up that one spot. It's not necessary. Uh, with all the faces taken care of, I need to true up the edges to end up with exactly the four and a half inch width. And uh, like my pattern showed, I had an extra sixteenth of an inch of thickness, but I've got a bit more in this width. So I'll use the joiner to make sure one edge is square and true, and I'll run these through the table saw and take a whisker off this side to make sure both edges are parallel. Then I'll use the thickness planer to bring these blanks down to that final width dimension of four inches. And obviously this part of the video has got to do with preparing uh, laminated blanks. If you're using solid wood, you can just start right here and uh, make sure everything's trued up before you go into the shaping process, which we'll do after I get this cleaned up. And before a pivotal operation like this, I always make sure to double check that the fence on the joiner is perfectly square, so I don't have to fight an inaccuracy through the rest of the project. And here I'm taking a very light pass, like about a thirty-second of an inch, just to make sure everything is straight, true, and square. Once I'm done with the joiner, I shave that other side on the table saw. And then all my blanks are precisely the same dimension, to make sure I don't have to deal with any inaccuracies throughout the rest of the milling process. Now I crank the thickness setting way up on the DW735 thickness planer and put on a pair of Smurf gloves, so that I can handle these stacks of blanks without losing my grip. I feed the pieces carefully through the thickness planer on the slow speed to minimize tear out, and you can see when it comes out of the thickness planer, everything is perfectly flush and smooth. I double check the width setting that I'm getting, and then tick another pass to dial everything in to exactly the width that I need for the finished molding. These are pretty light passes, but they're necessary for finishing the edges of the molding. That way I don't have a lot of sanding to do when this is all over. I make sure the stacks of blanks are nice and flush when I feed them into the thickness planer, and then support the ends on both the infeed and the outfeed side to minimize snipe on the ends of the pieces. But when it's all done, I'm a happy guy. Well, those are some uh, kind of tedious and detailed steps, but 
I want to go through and make sure that these blanks are identical, as identical as possible. And whether they're laminated blanks or solid wood, it's the same procedure, uh, except you don't have to take so much, uh, you don't have to pay so much attention about taking the right amount off of each edge. By being diligent with these steps, I end up with a stack of blanks that are identical in thickness and width. And each of the laminations is precisely the width I designed it to be, and the total width of the blanks is exactly four inches. And with all that millwork in the rear view mirror, it's finally time to start doing something a little more exciting. Whenever I talk about moldings, I end up talking about sequence because it's important to get the right steps in the right order. Everything up to this point, milling these blanks uh, has some procedures, but uh, making the molding itself, the contour, also has procedures. And you gotta give it some thought ahead of time so that you don't do one step ahead and regret it and make it more difficult to do that step later. The first step I do for this molding is to run the back out profile in the molder. And uh, I'm standing here in front of this little project. Uh, this is a box mantle I'm doing for my day job and uh, got this casing going on at the same time. So it's kind of a busy shop. Back at the scale drawing, I sketched in the, the back out profile here. It's just a 16th of an inch uh, swipe out of the back of the molding which helps it fit better against the wall when it's installed. And I need to do that before I do the front contour because the front is going to be thicker at one edge than the other. If I do those steps first, then the piece won't run through the molder right to do this notch out later. So that back out is first. And then I'll run the rabbet for this lip that fits into the jam. This is the jam right here. And then uh, cut that cove in there next. And last but not least, this face here needs to be removed. So the casing has a taper that kind of tilts towards the door frame, which is pretty typical of a casing. A couple of these steps could be done in a different order, but I've chosen to do them in this manner to, just to keep things organized. And the first decision I need to make is what's gonna be the front and what's gonna be the back of these blanks. And once I decide that, I can establish the back by doing the back out profile. Obviously this process uh, and the sequence is going to be different for every molding, but I am just talking about this so you have an idea of the thought process that goes into it because this pre-planning just helps the whole project go smoother and the end result to be better. And this is what a set of back out knives looks like. Uh, just a couple straight cutters with beveled edges. That puts a nice beveled edge on the back out. And the slot in these cutters allows me to adjust the width of the back out, depending on the piece of molding. I've got them set up for this molding, so they're going pretty wide. And it's just a matter of sliding those back and forth to get the right width. And then stops down in the molder determine how big the lug is on either side. But it's a pretty clean setup. You can do a back out with a dado blade also. But the back out knives in the molder do a nice job of it. And all in one clean, easy pass. I carefully feed the pieces through the molder end to end, butting them tight together to minimize any chance of snipe. But the milling process is quick and clean and leaves a nice back out profile in the back of these moldings, giving these pieces the pro look and function that I'm after because I'm the guy that's got to install this stuff. With that back out all complete, uh, the next step is to add the rabbet on the edge here. And that rabbet and this little tongue are what allow the casing to slip into the specially made jam here. And then uh, leaves this like little accent shadow line reveal there. So I'm gonna set up and do that, uh, that rabbet step next. And I'll say that um, the steps from here on out are basically, there's enough material in those uh, to do a standalone video on each one, but I'm going to keep them all wrapped up together in this long video um, just to, to keep them in a package and then uh, you can just use the timestamps to jump from one section to the other. I'll try to insert those in meaningful places so that you can dial in to the specific aspect uh, of the project if it's of interest by itself. I'll point out the rabbit again here on my full scale drawing to remind you of the profile that I'm shooting for with this step. It's this corner that gets notched out and the blank is still full thickness. So the rabbit is going to be deeper at this point 
then it'll end up once this face gets planed off. And you'll see that process, but it speaks to the type of operation I'll use for removing that material. Obviously, I've already done the rabbit on this section of trim. This uh, four foot section will be one of the head pieces of the casing on the door. And I want to talk about this a little bit because the nature of a rabbit is that only one surface is going to be cut directly by cutting action of whatever tool I use, whether it's a router bit or a saw or a joiner. So the cutter head will plane one surface, but then the other surface at 90 degrees is going to get kind of a sideways shearing action by the cutter head. And that shearing action um, tends to leave a rough surface and it also can chip out like this right here. In this instance, it's a little less crucial because this surface gets planed away later down to about here. This gets removed so that chipped edge won't be such of a problem. But I want to go about it in a way that this doesn't get ch chipped up too bad just as a matter of practice. And then the other thing is that I want both of these surfaces to have a smooth planed finish. I don't want saw marks in the finished product because both surfaces show in that little uh, reveal going around the door jam. And there's any number of ways of going about getting this rabbit. Um, I think I mentioned a saw. This could be made with two saw cuts. It could be done with a router. It could be done with a shaper. Um, it could be done with a dado blade. Uh, but I've settled on a two-step process starting off with the table saw and then finishing up uh, using the rabbiting ledge uh, and the rabbiting feature on my joiner. What the table saw blade does is it uh, disrupts the wood structure so that uh, the joiner doesn't have the tendency to tear out such big chunks in the planing process. So I've set up the table saw for making an initial cut. I've set the blade and the fence so that I'm making a cut that's a little shallower than the depth of the rabbit and a little narrower than the width of the rabbit. And all it's doing is making that little thin kerf slot, which is like a mini dado, to remove material and weaken the wood structure for when I go to the joiner and plane away the rest of that rabbit to get it from this configuration to this configuration. And you'll see that the planer will plane a little deeper than this and a little wider than that side of the cut. And that way I get the cleanest machine finish on those two surfaces on the initial pass for making this rabbit. And I'm using this Powermatic PJ882 uh, joiner to uh, remove this material here to make the rabbit look like this. Uh, anybody that's not familiar with it, uh, the rabbiting feature on a joiner is performed with no guard. Keep in mind the cutter is exposed. It does get covered up as the wood passes the cutter head, so that's just the way it is. But uh, some people tend to freak out when they see a tool with the guard removed. The way the rabbiting feature works on a joiner is that the uh, infeed table has an extension platform, a rabbiting ledge out here, and that supports the wood as it's fed past the cutter head. The cutter itself uh, has a cutting edge that's just a couple thousandths of an inch above the outfeed table, but the edge or the end of the cutter has to clear the edge of the outfeed table. Doesn't matter by how much, as long as it clears it. If this cutter doesn't extend beyond the edge of the table, it, the wood's not cut away and the piece just deflects out and the rabbit doesn't work. On a regular cutter head, there's three knives and each one of the knives extends beyond the edge of the outfeed table. On a helical cutter head, the cutters are staggered and for a bird shelix cutter head like this, there's a special rabbiting tip. This little head or this little cutter here is a parallelogram instead of kind of a rounded square. And the purpose of that dedicated cutter is this exact little point here that makes sure the wood is cut away so it clears the outfeed table. I hope that all makes sense. It's an important detail, but if you're using the rabbiting operation on a joiner, uh, those conditions have to exist for the rabbit to work. The nature of the cutter head uh, means that this surface here is being cut by the shear edge of the cutter, so it's being planed, but this surface here is being cut by the edge of that tooth instead of the face. So this is kind of like the edge of a sawtooth and it'll leave uh, small marks that look like they've been made with a, a saw blade with a small diameter on this surface. The joiner and the cutter itself have the capability of plowing this whole rabbit all in one operation. But with some of the complex grain in this pallet wood, um, it tends to tear out more. And that's why I go to the extra step of making that relief cut because the relief cut makes a nice smooth cut on the first pass a whole lot more likely. 
I'll run a short section here so you can see how this cutting action affects the end result I get making this rabbit. And you'll see that cutter head turn into a blur when I hit the switch. Naturally, when I'm doing the run, I'll be using these paddles for feeding the stock for a safer workflow. And you can see in this close-up how the joiner cut interfaces with the saw cut. The joiner is cutting deeper than the bottom of the saw cut here, so this corner right there is being cut by the little rabbiting tip on the joiner. It's a perfectly clean 90 degree corner. This little bit of material here is being sheared away by the side of the cutter, but the amount of wood there is so small it doesn't have the leverage to chip out this face. And remember that face will get milled away later anyways. The other thing is, and you probably won't be able to see it, is that this surface here has uh, marks that look like this from the edge of the cutter. They look like saw marks on there. And I'll clean that up after this process. And I know this is a kind of a mealy explanation of a simple process, but that rabbit needs to come out right. It's a finished surface on a finished molding, and I want it to fit um, perfectly in that jam. And I don't want to leave the impression that I can just take a piece of trim and then run it over the joiner and get that result. Uh, for some applications, that's fine. That rabbiting cutter there will make one heck of a rabbit all in one pass. Uh, but I want to show some of the measures that can be taken to get exceptional results uh, in difficult circumstances. And the difficult circumstances here are the, uh, the crumbly and irregular nature of this pallet wood because I don't want to ruin these pieces by having a bunch of blowouts that leave an unsightly finished product. But with the dust processor fired up, I'll, I'll plow this rabbit on these pieces and move on. For taking a heavy rabbiting pass like this, I adjust my feed rate in real time depending on the nature of the wood, the direction of the grain, etc., which I kind of judge by the snapping sound made by the cutter head. With a clean, smooth sound, I can increase this feed rate. With a sharp, snappy sound, I've got to reduce the feed rate to almost nothing to keep big chunks of wood from tearing out. And that's even though my cutter head is razor sharp and spinning fast. In what is most certainly the quickest easiest uh, step of this whole milling process. I'm taking a Bosch Colt router, a 1 16th inch radius round over bit, and uh, rounding off the back outside corner of the trim. Um, and I'm doing it at this point because it's easiest to do before the cove is put into the face of the trim. A small detail, but you got to make it easy on yourself because nobody else is gonna, right? And you can see the subtle and what I think meaningful difference between the sharp milled edge and the smooth but still crisp eased edge. There's quite a number of videos on YouTube showing how to cut coves with a table saw, but I'm going to show you a few tricks here that you haven't seen anywhere else. And I think it really speeds up the process, makes it more intuitive and quicker. Uh, there's no math, no calculations, no funny jigs. But it does require a couple key pieces of information. And the most important ones are the width of the cove and the depth of the cove cut. And I get that at the bench. And at this point, I've abandoned my scale drawing because I needed to change the radius of the cove to fit the actual piece I'm working with. So I've clamped a piece of the cove molding blank in the vise, and I'll do a little layout on here. And the first thing I'll do is lay out the thickness of the molding at the side next to the jam. And that is a half an inch. And through a process I won't get into here, I determined that a two and a quarter inch radius will be the right cove for this particular molding. So I drew that out here accurately on a piece of thin cardboard. And I want the cove to intersect right here where the cherry and maple come together. And then the same thing on this side where the cherry and maple meet. So I can just lay that curve on here like this. Much harder to do with the camera than otherwise. But that's where the curve is gonna be, right there. And there. And I changed the radius from my layout because I wanted this molding to be a little bit thicker in the middle here. And that'll do nicely. The reason I'm laying it out like this is the cove is going to be cut by registering on this surface. So I need to know the width of the cove at that surface and then the depth of the cove from that surface. And the width to here looks like two and three quarters. And the depth is just a little less than a half inch. So I'll just use 2 and 11 sixteenths and 7 sixteenths for my width and depth measurements on this cove. And the function of cutting coves on a table saw is the topic for a whole other video. So uh, I'll just cover it here in a nutshell. Um, if you run the wood straight past the table saw, it makes an eighth inch groove. 
If you were, however, to push the wood sideways to the table saw at 90 degrees, it would put a five inch radius cove in the end or in the face of the piece. And the trick to this is um, running the board at such an angle with the blade at such a height to end up with the curve that you're after. So there's a width here that'll be the 2 and 11 16 and there'll be a depth that's 7 16 um, And that's, that's the principle, but like I said, that's a whole other video. Um, there's a lot of ways to calculate the angle for getting the correct cove. I see somewhere there's a formula, you enter numbers and it gives you an angle, but I don't really want to know degrees of angle. I just want to know the uh, right angle to push the wood over the blade at. And the analog way for figuring this out to avoid all the formulas and everything is um, to make a disc that's the same diameter and the same thickness of a saw blade. I'm using a full kerf 8th inch uh, flat top grind blade and that flat top grind blade is something you don't see anywhere else. Uh, they're just using regular blades with the pointy teeth. A flat top grind blade makes a smoother cove. You'll see that when we do that part. But uh, the key is to have a disc that's the same thickness and diameter as the blade you're going to use. In my case, this blade is a 10 inch saw blade, but it's actually 9 and 13 16 in diameter. And I was able to determine that quite easily using a scalloper that I recently made. And using that dimension, I just confirmed that my disc is the same. And I'm not doing this as accurately as it is because I'm trying to get it shot in the video. But the disc and the blade are the same diameter and the same thickness. So the first part of this setup is to install my cove setting disc on the table saw's arbor and raise it to 7 16 of an inch in height. I shouldn't have to say it, but I will. Do not turn your table saw on when this plastic disc is mounted on the arbor. It would probably fly apart and hurt you very badly. I'm also using a Freud blade stabilizer for this setup to minimize any deflection in this disc. It's sure tempting to fire up that saw, but I'm not going to do it. I'll just put a mark at 7 16 of an inch on this piece of scrap and then raise up the cove setting disc to meet that mark. It's as simple as that. And the height of that disc now sets the depth of the cove. For the width of the cove, I simply cut a couple of scrap blocks at the width of the cove, which is 2 and 11 16 inches. This next part is so simple as to be laughable. All I do is take a little bit of Starbond accelerator and thick adhesive and glue these two little blocks in between two perfectly straight pieces of scrap. And don't forget, anybody watching this video can get 15% off any and all Starbond products by using exclusive offer code NLC at checkout at starbond.com. And there'll be a link in the video description if that's something you want to take advantage of. And within about a minute, I've got the only other setup fixture I need for setting up and cutting this cove. And this is the stupid simple part of this cove cutting setup. With the disc set to height or the cove depth, the edges of the disc representing the cut path of the teeth on that blade, this little spacer block, which is set to the width of the cove, will determine the angle and the location of the guide fence for this particular cove. I just put the cove width setup jig here in place, touch one edge of the disc here, touch the other edge of the disc there without deflecting the disc. And that automatically sets the angle for cutting this particular cove. I'll just mark it out here on these pieces of masking tape. Just like that. Next, I'll mark the guide fence offset from these cove cutting marks here by using the actual trim sample piece. Like that. And like that. Once I've made all the required layout marks, I'll remove the disc from the saw and put the blade in. And I've done a video showing how to make one of these clear cove cutting setup discs, and it's available on Patreon for all those who've gone above and beyond for next level carpentry by becoming patrons of this channel. Once the actual blade's installed, I line a straight edge with the cove cut offset marks, and clamp it to the table. Then I put one of the casing blanks up against the first fence and clamp a second straight fence to the other side. These fences aren't subject to a lot of force, but I do want them clamped firmly in place so nothing moves during the cove cutting operation. So that the finished setup has just enough space in between the two fences for the casing blank to pass through. And I'll make a note on the one straight edge so I don't run these pieces through backwards. And to ensure that this operates as smoothly as it can, I'll wipe some paste wax on the table and on these fences so the blanks slide through almost effortlessly. It doesn't take much imagination to figure out how this cove cutting process works. 
I just raise up the blade a little bit at a time and take successive passes that scoop out the face of the casing. And this is one procedure where having a dust collector is a real benefit because otherwise this can get pretty messy. And you can watch the cove cutting sneak up on the pencil mark on the end of this test piece of casing as I approach the final depth of the cove. And I'll take a few successive passes at a very slow feed rate when I've reached the final cove depth mark so that I end up with as smooth of a finish as possible on the cove itself, which saves time sanding when I'm done cutting the cove. And that's what the cove cutting process looks like uh, for this casing. What you can see with the setup is that I'm able to quickly dial in uh, the exact cove width and depth to the blanks that I'm after. Now, if you look really closely in the video, you see I had to make an adjustment. As I snuck up on the pencil mark that was laid out on the end of the cove, I realized that somewhere in my setup I had a small discrepancy. And this amount here, it's about a 32nd of an inch. I had to shift the fences over to make sure that that cove was exactly centered up when I finished. It's a minor adjustment and it's easy to make when everything else about the setup is accurate and very close. What other cove cutting videos on YouTube are lacking is the use of a flat top grind blade. The flat top grind blade provides a very smooth finish on this cove versus uh, a much rougher finish you get when you're using an alternate top bevel blade with the same setup. And the whole thing is very predictable for getting the right cove depth and width in relation to the offset edge thickness on this casing. If you try the cove process, I think you'll quickly realize that those things can be difficult to dial in with other setups that are a lot more complicated. And I like this one, even though it took me quite a while to get this all filmed for you to see when I'm just doing this in the shop, it actually goes uh, remarkably fast. After I've done my test piece, I just take notice of the position of the blade elevation crank handle when I'm all done. And then when I do the rest of the pieces, I make sure I end up at this same setting so that all the coves are the same depth and the same width on the finished pieces. And now I'm going to get to work and run the cove profile on the rest of the samples, the short pieces, and this stack of long pieces here. And I'll stop for a minute here to ask that you'd consider subscribing to Next Level Carpentry if you haven't already. I try to pack content like this into every video. Some videos are long, some are short. But the stuff I show here is stuff I do for projects that I sell to clients. It's not just making it up for a YouTube channel's sake. Subscribing is free and you'll always be notified when new videos like this get uploaded. I think I'll run this video as a live premiere when I get it all, uh, all the production done. And I always like hanging out and watching the chat come through from viewers as they see a video like this for the first time. This is the time that I mentioned that all the tools and supplies you see in the video are posted in a link in the video description below. That's under an Amazon influencers page for Next Level Carpentry. And Amazon requires that I inform you that they pay small ad fees to the channel for purchases made through those links, even though anything you buy is the same low online price you expect. So I always appreciate it. T-shirts like this one and posters from the shop and a few other things. Uh, Next Level Carpentry swag are available through Teespring in the video description along with a link to the Starbond website where you can use that special offer code NLC at checkout for 15% off any of those Starbond products that I like, use, and recommend. Uh, that's it for the infomercial. I'm going to go to work doing coves and then take you through a few more steps for finishing up these moldings. Stay tuned. I've got to reconfigure equipment set up in the shop because of the cut orientation in relation to the table, but that's simple to do with portable equipment so I can make it happen quickly. To save setup time and work more efficiently, I run each piece in the batch of casing over the saw blade at each successive height setting so that I only have to dial in to that final height setting one time at the end. And believe me, the last thing I want to do at this stage of the game is run any of these pieces through backwards. I find that a light mist of water sprayed on my Smurf gloves occasionally helps them renew their traction so that I'm able to push these pieces steadily and firmly over the table saw blade and run each piece through at an extra slow feed rate a couple of times to make the cove finish as smooth as possible to minimize sanding, which is the next step. 
And you can see the difference that this final light pass makes here on this cove. The teeth are cutting in a slightly different position on the final pass as they did on the first pass. So some of the ridges left behind after the first pass are smoothed off now. And every ridge that I smooth off with the table saw on this final pass is one less ridge that I have to sand off in the next step. Well, if you ask me, this kind of operation is woodworking at its finest. Making a piece of equipment do something it's not necessarily uh, thought of doing coming up with a very unique product, consistent results coming out just the way it's supposed to. And creating something that's never been made before. And when all those things come together, it's just a great uh, feeling of accomplishment. So um, after all that, uh, the next step is gonna be to sand this cove, which is my unfavorite part of the entire build. But I'll show you a little trick you don't see anywhere else for making that as easy as possible. I must mention at least once in every video how much I dislike sanding. Well, the upside of that is it forces me to think for ways of sanding more efficiently. So I get more done faster and have to do less of it. For sanding all these coves, this is what I do. And I'm well aware that there's all manner of custom sanding blocks available for purchase, but none of them are as custom as this. To start out, I want to make a handle for my sanding block. So I've got a section of dowel here with a flat face and a scrap of wood. So I'll deploy a bit of Starbond glue in typical fashion, spraying adhesive on one side and applying the thick CA glue to the other side. Once I've given those 10 seconds to stick together, I now have a handle. Simple as that. Next, I'll take a bit of shrink wrap, this press and seal stuff, and stick a piece down as snug and close as I can to the inside of this cove. And yeah, the tear-off strip on this package leaves something to be desired. Now, I'll mix up a good-sized batch of Bondo. And notice that this is Bondo, not Bondon't. Make sure you get the right stuff. And I always buy mine from a guy named James. That's Bondo. James Bondo. That tube of hardener is no good, so I'm going to have purple Bondo out of this. And I want this batch to kick off fast, so I'm not sparing the hardener. And I'm just looking for an even, consistent color that tells me this is mixed thoroughly. Once it's mixed thoroughly, I just put a blob of that down inside this molding, like that. Probably leave it a little thicker at the edges. Something like that. Isn't that artistic? And I kind of puddle it around like that. Wipe some on my little handle here. Just going to kind of puddle that handle down in the middle there. Obviously, I'm kind of making this up as I go. But I know what I want to end up with. And what I want to end up with looks about like that. And I'll give that about 10 minutes to set up. I'll take a quick phone call, check a couple emails. Next thing you know, Bondo's set up. And my little custom sanding block is all good to go. You can use a utility knife to kind of clean up some of these edges before that Bondo sets up hard as a rock. And then I just take some 80 grit hook and loop sandpaper and let it conform to that pad. And just like that, I am one cold sand and food. And where besides next level carpentry do you get a tip like that stuck in the middle of the video, not even mentioned in the thumbnail? Tough to beat, right? I really did get a nice finish on these coves using that flat top grind blade in the cove cutting fixture. And the custom sanding block fits great and works great. But it really is still too much sanding for this guy. So I went ahead and made a scraper. Uh, the curve on this scraper is a five inch radius, just like the uh, cove setting template. This um, scraper is made out of a piece of this band iron used for strapping lumber and steel. And, uh, that's a whole nother video in itself, so I'm not gonna go off on that rabbit trail. But I will show you how this works and talk a little bit about the sanding process. And I'm casting a glancing light with a flashlight on the surface of the wood, so you can kind of see what I'm talking about because it highlights the texture of the wood. I'm using the scraper to go basically perpendicular to uh, the sawtooth scratches in this wood, and I'm just scraping on the up side of this curve perpendicular to those scratches. It's going to be a little tricky to see, but I think you'll see the scratches virtually disappear with the scraper. You can see the shavings pulled off by the burr on the scraper. I've got this sharpened like a crude card scraper, and my goal is to get about 95% 
of those sawtooth marks out of here before I go from scraper to sandpaper. I'll try another angle here in an attempt to show you what this process looks like. And I've got to be careful not to trade saw blade marks for scraper marks that still need to be sanded out. But this really is an efficient process. And if you dislike sanding as much as I do, it's worth the time it takes to make a specialized scraper for a job like this. And scraping off that much wood is a whole lot faster than sanding it off. 10 minutes of concentrated scraping probably saves me over a half an hour of sanding. So I think it's a good investment of time. And you can still see a few sawtooth marks in the surface, along with some little gouges made by the scraper. But at this stage, it's more than ready for 80 grit sandpaper. I'm wearing a Smurf glove for a little better grip, and I'm using an 80 grit sanding disc along with the sanding block. And a sharp 80 grit disc has an aggressive scratch that removes the rest of those deeper irregularities and imperfections in fairly short order. And I alternate between a straight sanding motion and a side to side rocking motion to get the best averaging effect with the sanding process. You can see the effect I get with that much effort. And that section is easily sanded to a consistent 80 grit scratch. And like any sanding process, I step through the grits to end up at 220 for this pre-sanding process. I'll take it up to 320 right before I put on the gel varnish in the end, but this is where I need to end up for now. And as long as I'm only sanding out 80 grit scratches and not any sawtooth marks, it doesn't take long to bring the scratch up to 100 grit, and then I follow it with 120 and then 220. And 220 grit is always the litmus test for this kind of work. If you've been kidding yourself, you'll see the imperfections you left behind with the previous grits once you give it a few licks with that 220. But in this case, this section of trim is ready for the next step, which I'm excited to say is the last bit of millwork where I plane down this edge of the casing to bring the cherry strip down flush with the maple strip precisely at the intersection of the two woods. I've got a flawless cove all the way up and down this piece of trim. And after seeing that, there's probably less of a question of why I kind of hate sanding. I had to do that same process on the other long pieces there and the short pieces and that was after coming up with a system for getting the scratches out and achieving that fine finish but the effort's worth it because this trim's going on that door it's going to be there for a long time and i'll get to smile every time i walk by because i'm so pleased with the way it's coming out and i'd like to do the final step for this milling in the thickness planer because it provides such a beautifully smooth pass but i can't because if you remember these two surfaces aren't in the same plane and they don't get planed at an angle. So I'm going to use the rabbiting feature on the joiner one last time for this final pass. The depth of cut is going to be 7 30 seconds of an inch, but I'm just going to sneak up on it by gradually adjusting the infeed table on the joiner until it's planing right where it needs to be. By setting the fence on the joiner, I'm able to use this rabbiting feature to just plane away the part that needs to be planed away without digging into and damaging the other side of the cove. That's exactly the cut I need. It's removing material off this flat face so that the cove and the flat face meet precisely at the point where the maple and cherry meet. It's a pretty healthy cut, almost a quarter of an inch, but with a slow feed rate, I get a nice smooth finish on this. And I end up with a thickness of a full half inch for the thin edge of this casing, which if you'll remember, is exactly what I was shooting for with the scale drawing that you saw a few times earlier in the video. Gotta love it when a plan comes together. And it's easy to run all the pieces over the joiner with this setting and get consistent results because the blanks I started off with were consistent thickness. And here's another case where pre-planning means spending time up front, but it spares me a fight at the end. I'm using a really slow speed rate as I mill off the face of this trim because it's the only chance I get to give it a smooth finish. The rabbiting process doesn't allow me to take a second pass and I don't want to do extra sanding on this little face. So I can save myself a lot of time sanding later if I spend a little more time planing now. And that, folks, is what this trim will look like forever and always. And I hope you can see uh, at this stage of the game how the sequence I talked about at the beginning has a lot to do with the way this comes out. Each one of these steps is performed in a certain sequence, planned out ahead of time, and that way I'm not backed into a corner at the end trying to figure out how to get that face uh, planed off clean and smooth. If there's any variance in the thickness of the blanks, the joint between, uh, the glue joint between the 
maple and the cherry wouldn't be even. This would look off, but as it is, following a decent protocol system and paying attention to accuracy all the way through, I end up with this. I mentioned much earlier about cleaning up the second face of the rabbit, and I'll take care of that real quick, right now. I'll just clamp the piece firmly in the bench habit, draw a little line on there to make sure I'm planing the surface clean, and then quickly scrape it smooth with a sharpened putty knife to get the result I'm after. And whatever marks were there from the cutter on the joiner are removed quickly and cleanly, along with the pencil mark, using a properly wielded and properly sharpened putty knife. And scraping that little edge is the last part of the fabrication process I used for making this molding. Of course, I finished detail sanding all the pieces before applying a couple coats of a satin gel varnish to these pieces of trim, but that's kind of routine carpentry, and this video has got long enough without it. As soon as I get done shooting this segment, I've got to make the money cuts on this casing and fit it around the door opening for the video thumbnail and for the intro of this video. There's a little bit of back to the future there. I hope you'll join me in thanking everybody on this list of patrons at Patreon. Everybody here that you see on the list has gone above and beyond for supporting video production at Next Level Carpentry, and I really appreciate it. And if you're motivated to make a pledge to support Next Level Carpentry and see your name on this list, just follow the link uh, to Patreon in the video description below where you can sign up and join the Above and Beyond Club here for the channel. I'm building a growing list of uh, patron-only videos, and those videos show some behind-the-scenes stuff, insider stuff from the channel, like making the cove setting disc that I showed in this video. If that interests you, check it out, and thanks in advance. The video production pipeline here at Next Level Carpentry is jam-packed with video content that I'm excited about producing and showing to you. In episode number nine of the Pallet Wood Door Build Series, I'll show you how I infill the Pallet Wood Door Pallet with creative use of pieces of pallet wood with a lot of character in them, and it's a unique method, process, and look that I guarantee you've not seen anywhere else. But before I can get back to the pallet wood door building series, I'm going to do a next level carpentry exclusive masterclass for a process I call live edge joinery. It's part of a project on my day job. I'm really excited about doing it and showing you because it's a unique process that I've only done once before and I don't see anybody else doing it and certainly not doing it the way that I go about it. In the video, you'll see these two huge elm slabs melded together into one wide slab that I'm using for some live edge cabinet doors, something else you've probably never seen. So with all that, as always, until next time, thanks for watching. So many videos, so little time. <sighs> oh, you're still here? <laughs> yeah, well, I think there's probably a name for people like us, uh, the people that watch a movie to the end, then they watch the end credits, and you watch the end of the end credits just to see if they might slip one more little thing in there at the end of the video. Well, it's times like this that we continue watching for. I figured if anybody feels like hanging around after that long video just to see what's at the end, uh, you deserve a reward, and that is to see the finish get applied to this trim. I'm using a gel polyurethane for the finish on this. Uh, it's a good durable finish. It leaves a wonderful feel on the wood, brings out the grain nicely, and uh, it's easy to repair. A sprayed-on finish, if it gets chipped, you have to feather everything out and then respray it. But with this stuff, um, you just scuff it up a little bit and put some more on there. But that, friends, is what this trim is going to look like. Of course, you already know that because you saw it in the video thumbnail. But I haven't taken the thumbnail shot yet. I just I've got to finish these pieces, miter them, and put them up there on the door to get that uh, thumbnail image done. But if you haven't ever used this gel polyurethane, of course, it's listed in the video description for the product. But you can probably find it at a local paint store. And this is how you put it on, you just swab it on there. The hardest part is getting ready to this point. I sanded this trim all the way to 320 grit to get a wonderfully smooth finish. And it pays off now with the luster of that trim. And it feels as good as it looks, let me tell you.
pretty remarkable stuff. And the first coat, I really lay it on there, let it soak into the wood everywhere as much as it wants to. Subsequent coats aren't uh, as thirsty as this. But that first one, I just, I just let the wood just keep soaking it in. And I won't keep you stuck around forever because you don't want to sit there and watch this stuff dry. But once it's dry overnight, uh, another day or whatever, I'll scuff this with 500 grit sandpaper and give it a nice, another nice coat. This coat kind of acts as a sealer, but it really has to dry for the second coat to lay on top of it. Otherwise, it just keeps soaking in if you don't let this dry long enough. Anyways, there you have it. And thanks to all you for watching to the end of the end of the end. See you next time.